Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Greetings, listeners, to Rhonda Chervin's Radio Journal. This is the last time that I will be reading from my new book, that's not out yet, but it's in manuscript form, and it's on my mind, and I thought there are people who don't like to necessarily read books but like to listen to radio programs, and so here it is. But I'm already on Chapter 5, so if you haven't gone to the earlier one, go on, look at the, look at the list of topics in it with, when it says reading, the da-da-da, Start with the first one, otherwise you won't understand what I'm doing. So, okay. So, this is day five, and the themes are economic philosophy, socialism versus modified capitalism, and the afternoon theme is military conflict, peace versus just war. And here is the morning session, Father Doria. Most of the active saints through the ages were fiercely for the poor, but it is only fairly recently that parish Catholics thought about influencing the political scene in the way we now think of concerning social justice issues. With the advent of democracy, industrialism, capitalism, socialism, and communism, the Catholic in the pew certainly had opinions, and some became active in such movements as unionism, civil rights, struggling or even revolution against repressive regimes, solidarity and pro-life to mention some especially prominent causes. In my seminary training, this is Father Doria, I read with the greatest interest the social encyclicals of the popes. It seems as if some on the spectrum while inveighing against such trends as liberation theology, are not as knowledgeable as one would hope about the Church's social justice valid teaching. For example, although St. Pope Paul II was fiercely critical of the communism under which he lived in Poland, he also wrote about the lesser but real evils of unchecked capitalism. I was startled when St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta on a visit to the United States, remarked that while the social justice conferences here seemed to be bogged down in controversy, her own sisters had taken care of 10,000 dying poor in Calcutta. And somehow Catholics don't talk enough to others about the enormous works of care throughout the centuries, mostly for the poor of the church in hospitals and schools. It is argued that while liberation theologians used to visit St. Oscar Romero, he was actually not one of them, even though he condemned repression of the poor by evil regimes. Nevertheless, there is surely a great division in our church today between those who think that a modified capitalism with a safety net is good versus those who believe that only a government-controlled economy can overcome the still great disparity between the rich and the poor. Presently, the the issue of immigration has become the most controversial, pitting pitting Catholics who affirm the greatest possible openness to immigrants on the basis that their bad governments have led to extreme poverty against those who insist controlled borders are a necessity for our economy. So here is your morning question. How has your family background, your Catholic college and graduate education, and your own research influenced your teaching on economic issues? 
James. When I was a child and teen in Louisiana, there was no Republican Party there. You either voted Democratic or you didn't vote. When I started college at St. Athanasius, most of the professors and students voted Democratic on the basis precisely of that party seeming closer to the social justice teachings of the church. It was only with Roe v. Wade that many Catholics I knew switched over to the Republican Party as more pro-life, even if not as effective as wished. I myself, however, was unable to switch allegiance from Democrat to Republican because of my conviction that Republicans are willing to accept exploitation of the poor by capitalist monopolies in this country and in countries all over the world. Rhonda, how different our backgrounds were. My parents being ex-communists, fierce anti-communists, taught us even as youngsters about the horrors of Stalin's totalitarian state. In the public schools of that time, the 1940s, we saw educational films lauding the genius of industrialization. That we had the highest standard of living of any country in the whole world because of capitalism was taught as self-evident. However, by high school in the 1950s, the picture changed so much that our parents seemed to be the only ones who voted Republican. As a Catholic in graduate school studying philosophy, socialism was usually considered a good option. I always had the impression, however, that socialism is flawed by the simple fact that without the incentive of profit, the whole world would be like the Soviet Union. In such places, there was less abject poverty than under the Tsar, but such a terribly low standard of living that almost everyone drowned their despair and drink every night of the week. James, I don't teach social philosophy, but my overview is that every economic system has advantages and disadvantages given the fallen nature of man. If I visit the homes of most middle-class friends, I find them cluttered with thousands of thousands of possessions that would signify success, but their teens are mostly on drugs. Rhonda, I agree, but is the remedy to live in countries where life is so drab that, for instance, in Russia, I have read most women have no children at all, but an average of 20 abortions each. On the other hand, even though I vote Republican because of the abortion platform of the Democratic Party, I chide some of my Republican friends for speaking as if the U.S. is the good country in spite of our huge abortion record. On the immigration issue, I find it paradoxical that Catholic people coming from countries where the abortion rate is much lower are dying to come to the U.S. and then put their children in public schools where they will learn that killing their babies is good. I absolutely agree that exploiting the poor for capitalist gain is wrong, but how can so many Democrats act as if the 60 million aborted babies since Roe v. Wade is nothing? James, I don't. James continues, on another topic, some Catholics who are against social welfare programs consider them to be simply ways for lazy people to avoid working. I had a friend who worked for a government assistance program. This is what he said. I know that about half the people on assistance are cheating on the system. For example, the day the assistance check arrives in the mailboxes in our ghetto areas, the drug dealer mails visit the single parent family, get the mother to sign the check, cash it, and leave them still without necessities. So why do I continue at my job? Because I'm working for the other half. Rhonda, I remember hearing on the radio that in one state they had put in a program of actively making almost all people on assistance work and gradually get off government help. To get to the immigration issue, I heard from a Catholic radio show man that he had personally gone down to the border to see what was really going on. He was told that more than half the so-called separated families were really children who had been given over to sex traffickers in hopes they could live better economically here and later bring the whole family over. And then there is the whole drug dealer problem with some immigrants. 
and they get free medical in the U.S. while many of our own poor don't qualify. James, I'm hoping some politicians come up with real solutions to all of these complicated immigration problems. I don't trust journalists much about such issues. Rhonda, me neither. I mean, the fake news thing drives me crazy. How can we know what to think if we don't know which commentators have the real facts? By the way, I thought you might like the way I taught the need to help the poor in, in my ethics classes. I say, suppose you were going to Walmart to buy six T-shirts t- on sale. At the door, you see a poor woman huddled with a baby crying in her arm. I have no money to buy food and no milk left in my breast. Can you help me? Wouldn't you buy one T-shirt and give the rest of your money to her? Now, here's the point. You could give some of the money you earn that you spent on, spend on the luxuries to the starving in, say, Calcutta by giving it to them through Mother Teresa's sisters and brothers. You think, yeah, sure, but probably the people who run the charity get most of the money as part of the overhead of their fundraisers. Now, in India, Mother Teresa's sisters don't even have toilet paper. Where's the overhead? Now, in parentheses, I have, if this argument seems strong, consider sending money to Mother Teresa's sisters and brothers through their U.S. headquarters, Missionaries of Charity, 335 East 145th Street, Bronx, New York, 10451. When I send contributions, I append to the check for the most starving people who serve in the world. James, it is the teaching of Jesus and of the church that our luxuries belong to the poor, but what is a luxury is too hard to define to spell it out from the pulpit. For a pianist, a piano isn't a luxury. Or for that matter, neither is a computer for a professor at lunch. Some of the comments around the table were these. I knew a professor of Chinese who had escaped from Mao's China. He said the usual statistics about massacres by the communist regime were way low. This made me think that it is a travesty that the Vatican has now accepted the bishops and priests who are in league with the communists instead of helping the persecuted underground Chinese Catholic Church. Another person said, I recently joined the American Solidarity Party. It's a new party based on a humanistic, mostly Christian philosophy that includes pro-life and social justice. Google it. Another one said, I was talking to an anesthesiologist from India about the scandals about bad conditions and wages in U.S.-owned companies hiring people there. His response was this, you Americans have no idea about what life is like there. One teenage girl getting a low salary in a factory owned by one of your companies earns the only money that can be used to feed a whole family of starving people. Another one said, the food we throw away into the garbage in the United States could feed the whole world. At Mass, at the Mass, Father Doria took up a collection to help provide tuition to poor students in Africa who are affiliated with St. Athanasius University. At Adoration, during Adoration of the Holy Eucharist, I prayed this way, Oh, my Jesus, you had such a love for the poor. How sad it must make you when you see so many in developed countries wasting so much money and food. Please inspire us to do more for poverty and good social justice initiatives. The afternoon session, military conflict, peace versus just war. Father Doria, this afternoon I'd like you to work together on whether pacifism is the only answer to violence or whether some version of the just war theory can be Christian. Rhonda, when I taught this subject in ethics, I, find it, I found it helpful to distinguish between two types of pacifism. Pacifism A, given the enormous emphasis on peace in the words of Jesus, I have chosen to be a peacemaker. Any kind of taking of the life of another human being is a sin for me, even if the motive is self-defense. I reject capital punishment and any war. 
I do not, however, think that those who choose to kill others in self-defense or in a war against aggressors are committing a sin. Pacifism B holds that any killing of a human being is evil for any person and especially for a Christian. James, I have not had to make the choice of evading a draft in what others thought to be a just war, but if I had been, I'm pretty sure I would have refused to fight. Just the same, I would not think all Christians who did kill were sinful. I agree with the theory that whereas in the time of Jesus there was no way any Jews or later Christians could have won in any battle, once there were whole areas of the world governed by Christians, it was taught that killing in defense, self-defense or defense of the country was licit. Rhonda, I actually had trouble with that when I first became a Catholic. I thought pacifism B was self-evident. What helped me understand church teaching about self-defense and just wars was the concept that an unjust aggressor forces his life by such action. An analogy could be that a driver who is spaced out on drugs can't blame a safe driver for hitting his or her car to avoid being hit. James, I do think that all Christians should work for peace in their personal lives and in society at large. How impressive it is to read how Gandhi managed to dethrone the English colonialists through nonviolent resistance, and how wonderful was Martin Luther King to apply such principles to fighting of civil wars for his people. Rhonda, it seems to surprise some pro-lifers when I mention that heritage as part of why we chose to pray in front of abortion clinics or block the doors versus trying to bomb baby killer abortuary, abortionists. James, just the same, isn't it contradictory when some pro-lifers still insist that capital punishment is, is right? Rhonda, I think the original statement in the Catechism is good. It says that even if justified in the case of grave crimes, it is more merciful to forgive, but it includes the clause where conditions such as lifetime imprisonment mean that innocent people will still be protected from those convicted. Now, many say this is now the case worldwide. I doubt it. For one thing, accounts of prison conditions I have read stress the corruption of the God. So the point would be that if, if forgiveness lets the person out earlier who then goes and does this again, then you have a right to capital punishment if you can't be sure that you can keep them in for life. Besides, Rhonda continues in the book, how can the same Catholics who oppose the killing of pro proven evildoers still vote for those who allow the violence of abortion of totally innocent babies? Now back to just war theory. The catechism written after the advent of nuclear war does rule out indiscriminate bombing of civilians. So it is not only the intention, but also the means that can be wrong. Dinner. Father Doria, at your tables, I think it would be useful to tell each other which of the wars you have read about or participated in would fall into the category of just in your estimation. I said I thought it very hard to know if one is relying on historical and biographical materials. So for many of us, the conditions in the U.S. at the time of English colonialism didn't seem anything like those of Europe in World War II. But if we were living then, it could be different. Someone mentioned that Abraham Lincoln once admitted that without belief in God and an afterlife, he could never sleep at the thought of all who died in the Civil War. Several talked about the irony of Americans considered England to be the aggressor, while at the same time justifying how we took over the lands of the Native Americans. The healing session. Father Doria, I was wondering what we could do with these topics this evening. After all, few professors of philosophy and theology commit sins of exploitation of the poor or of fomenting wars. 
Then I thought it would be good to pray for healing for others who have been victims of such things, sins, but also ourselves if we or family members have been hurt through unjust economic situations or the victims of war in terms of loss of life or long time, lifelong trauma. I, Rhonda, was surprised to realize that none of those hurtful situations applied to me except in the most trivial form as in having less new clothing than upper-class, middle-class schoolgirls. Praying about this increased my desire to express gratitude for all I have been given and to give even more time and money to the really poor when possible. Father Doria, I gave our priests the night off since Fridays can be busy in their parishes, but if you wish, I can hear confessions at the end. Day six, hope for the church suggested follow-ups. Father Doria, I'm hoping that due to this seminar, we will not be still divided in purgatory. Do you want to see in purgatory one mansion for those who watered down Catholic dogmatic and moral truth? And another mansion for those who spoke the truth but with hate? Laughter. Pet peeve. I would like to see these hateful, sarcastic descriptions by Catholics about other Catholics expunged from your vocabulary. If you never say such words aloud or in your thoughts or have never even heard of them, be glad. So people will say, instead of socialist, they'll say, Kami Lib. Instead of same-sex female attraction or same-sex male attraction, they call people lesbos or fairies. Instead of doubting Catholics, they say cafeteria Catholics. Instead of militants, they say fanatics. Instead of lovers of tradition, they say old-fashioned pre-Vatican II dinosaurs. Now I would like to read you an article I read just yesterday. And a lot of it will be sanitary for all of us, no matter where we place ourselves in the, on my spectrum. So some of it sounds like four, some of it sounds like two, some of it sounds like three. So I'm repeating a lot of it. I'm hoping that a lot of it will be sanitary for all of us. Uh, this is written by a man called Anthony Esselin, and he's a writer in residence of Magdalen College. And this article is entitled, What Can Unite Us Catholics? And he says, amidst our unfortunate and time-bound divisions as regards partisan politics, I wonder whether it is possible to come up with a set of fundamentals that all Catholics can agree upon. Here is my attempt. This is Ethelin. One, all the tenets of the Nicene Creed are true without reservation or equivocation. The Father is the Father from whom all fatherhood derives as from its originating fountain. It is no mere customary name. Human fathers could is merely analogical by comparison. The Father is the co-eternal word through whom all things were made. The Holy Spirit proceeds co-eternally from the Father and the Son. The word was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and made man to suffer and die for us and for our sins. And he rose again as all flesh will rise again. Two, the words of Jesus are prescriptive forever. They are never to be made really, really relative to his place and time. When it comes to God, faith, good and evil, and man and his destiny, we are never to suppose that we know better than the Lord, for he is our Lord. We are not to be patronized. He is not to be patronized or demoted to historical greatness. He alone has the words of everlasting life. It is not impossible that Christ, who has flocks we may not know of, will save those who do not know they were being saved through the agency of his church. It is not, however, to be presumed in the case of individuals or people 
Evangelizing is imperative. Go forth, says the Lord, and make disciples of all nations. Four, the Lord has willed that we come to knowledge of him by means of other human beings in general and by the church specifically. Therefore, we must resist all temptations to place the words and examples of the Lord on one side and the teachings of the apostles and of the church on the other as if in opposition or if the letters of St. Paul or the other apostolic writers might be denigrated or ignored. Five, the church's teachings regarding sex, marriage, and family life are true, salutary, and liberating. They are discoverable by natural reason and by an unconstrained reading of scripture and of the words of the Lord himself. Sins against them are destructive of the person, the family, and the common good and cause especially serious harm, material, social, and spiritual, to children and to the poor. Separation of husband from wife may in some cases be a necessary evil, as the amputation of a gangrenous limb may be, but is nevertheless a great social evil, even when it is morally permissible. Six. Now, here's the part, everything um, that I've read so far, dear listeners, sounds like fours in my spectrum. However, the rest, some of the rest sounds like things that many twos and threes would insist on. The command to assist the poor is absolute and personal. Every Catholic must be engaged in it. Material poverty may be first in the order of urgency, as a man dying of thirst needs a drink of water before he needs a sermon. But as the soul is greater than the body, so also moral, intellectual, and spiritual poverty is more dreadful than material poverty, and these two we are commanded to alleviate or remedy. Human life is sacred. Innocent human life must never be taken intentionally. That includes our own lives. We are made in the image of God, and therefore, when we encounter any human life, we are on human and holy ground. We stand in the light of one for whom God made the world. Nor may we stand idly by while the sick and hungry need our care. But what we do to the least of them, the sick, the dying, the homeless, the unborn child, we do to Christ himself. Eight. All that we possess comes from God and is meant to serve and glorify him. Our bodies are not our own to dispense with as we please. Our material wealth is not our own to dispense with as we please. That is a fact of our existence. We are creatures. Such sinners as we are must never forget it, for we have been purchased at a price. I was especially, I, Rhonda, was especially uh, uh, struck by her, him saying, our material wealth is not our own to dispense with as we please. See, this sounds very much uh, like twos, ones, twos, and threes would say. As this nine, as the Sabbath is the crown of the week, so all of our work should be oriented toward the Sabbath, its joy and its rest, the glory we give to God and our coming together with other human beings for the common good on earth and for a foretaste of the eternal good to come. Work for work's sake is a form of that spiritual sluggishness known as ascedia. Ten. The world of remunerative labor should be organized so as to provide gainful employment to able-bodied or able bodied or able-bodied or able-minded men with wages sufficient to support their wives and children in a becoming way. This does not mean that women do not work. It does mean that the first aim of just social policy regarding work and wages is the health of the household, so that is what the very word economy implies. Eleven, as the yeast leavens the whole of the dough, so the Catholic faith should leaven every feature of the Catholic school So, as to what is taught, how it is taught, and who teaches it. Catholic teachers must in their public lives be witnesses to the truth of the faith. Twelve, worship is the solemn and joyful duty we owe to God. All speeches of the Mass must be oriented ad deum, patrum et filium et spiritum factum, 
Worship that turns a congregation inward upon itself is deficient at least, even when it's undertaken with good intent. Mass must not be demoted to a social. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, says the Lord. If we do not, we will be like those who have little, and even the little they have will be taken away. For man is that sort of creature who is united only from above. Our brotherhood depends on our acknowledging the fatherhood of God. Now Father Doria says, what about it, my fellow Catholics? Can we agree at least to these? Father Doria smiled. Of course I realize not all of you agree with everything in this hopeful vision. Still you may find some of the wording challenging in areas where you may be weak. To follow up for our crisis in the church seminar, you might consider reading the catechism from cover to cover, seeing what you might have missed the first time you read it. You might ask others in the spectrum, especially moderate, what writers they like best. For example, many who disagree on subjects we have been talking about find common ground in spirituality books such as those of Henri Nouwen. At the end of the seminar, Father Doria said, if this helped you understand people on other parts of the spectrum of the division, maybe Rhonda, our participant who writes books the most quickly, could make this into a manual for ministry to other groups. The closing mass, Father Doria, my guess is that you've heard more than you ever wanted from me, so I'm going to make this short and in the form of a prayer. Holy Spirit, we are part of your church, and your church is in crisis. Help us to glimpse the plan of love you have for us. May whatever is true in the concepts of any part of the spectrum be expressed in such a way that all of us may be able to hear and become more holy. After the Our Father, at the time of the gesture of peace, Father Doria suggested that we extend, extend a handshake or embrace of peace all around the chapel with all the other participants. That afternoon, on the participant evaluations of the crisis in the church seminar, Father Doria read these comments from Rhonda and James. That is, he read them to himself when he was read to himself. These comments from Rhonda and James. Rhonda, I don't think that the divisions can be overcome. I think we more and more will be in different parishes depending on the priest's place on the spectrum. However, I learned from James, Molly, and others. I had fresh insight to some of the truths they hold dear. I learned that we don't have to hate each other or view each other with sarcasm but try to understand others better and pray for each other more. James wrote, and help me understand all the anger better. In my classes, I think I will be able to present aspects of each of these issues with greater knowledge of the philosophies of the church behind differing positions. And that is the end of my little book, Crisis in the Church, which will be illustrated by beautiful graphics graphics when it comes out as a little book. God bless you all. Goodbye to this segment of Rhonda's journal. After this, I'll go back to random insights. God bless you all. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.